Well, this is a lot of fun to do this. So exciting. This is and, so cool. And I can hear the music from the distance. Isn't I know. that cool? You know, this is like you say every week on All Things Gardening. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll be seeing you in the garden. Yeah. And it's really happening. We are in a garden here in Huntington. This is Gretchen's Garden. Yeah. And we're bringing All Things Gardening live stream via YouTube to everybody. Yes. Everyone's invited <laughs> to the garden. And we want you to ask questions too, so. Just ask questions and Charlie about can anything, answer them. About really. the, well, mostly about the garden, right? Oh, well, yeah, that too. <laughs> <laughs> but let's just listen to Gretchen for a little bit. She's actually a professional violinist. Beautiful. We'll go meet her and ask her about her gardens and her house. And yeah. <gasps> Lovely. <laughs> Hi. How are you, Gretchen? Good. Nice to see you guys. Yeah, nice to, nice see, to you. see you too. And that was a beautiful piece. What were you playing? Um, that's uh, Salut d'Amour by Elgar. Nice. Do, Great. You, do you often play for the for the plants around here? <laughs> um, not all the time. It's definitely a nice season for it. But um, I play in a string quartet, and we sometimes play music out on the patio of like free concerts for the community. Oh, for oh, everyone here beautiful. in Huntington. Oh, yeah. that's a yeah. nice idea. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, well, thanks for uh, ushering us in with some beautiful music. <laughs> You're welcome. But we're really here to look at your gardens. Yes, I'm excited yeah. to show you everything. <laughs> and it's great that you invited us out here, and it's a beautiful night to do this. Yes. It's a warm, balmy September night. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it could change at any moment. True. <laughs> uh, so could you tell us a little bit about how long you've been here and why you like to garden? Sure. I moved to Vermont in 2017 from California. I'm actually an East Coast girl, so kind of went over a few different states and then decided to settle in Vermont, bought this house. And um, I've always enjoyed gardening, but I grew up in downtown D.C. and didn't really have this much space to manage. Um, and so this is actually my first big garden. And it's got a lot of projects, and um, <laughs> what draws me to gardening is I really like um, like touching the dirt. I think that that can be very helpful for people with anxiety like me. And then I also mm -hmm. enjoy growing food seasonally. Vermont's a short season, but yep. and experimenting with new, um, well, not new maybe to everyone, but new to me, kind of mm -hmm. plants. Mm -hmm. So from yeah. flowering plants to, to edible plants and so on. So. Right. And I'm on a mission to remove... Uh, more and more grass in this um, so okay. that's also part of my approach to gardening is to find more and more um, kind of beneficials to and more pollinators and we're going to show a little bit of grass reduction today yeah <laughs> that's right. we're going to help you a lot a little bit with yeah. that yeah yes, that's yeah. great and then the buildings around here are kind of interesting <laughs> yeah yeah the, um, this is a very <laughs> unique house that's been um, pretty memorable for a lot of people who've grown up in Huntington. These are two very old barns. Um, they're from at least 1830. Mm -hmm. um, it was a livery for horses before the automobile, and then it was a gas station and a car mechanic um, oh, until wow. the 70s when cool. the gas pump was removed. And then this house has been expanded on the top. Um, it's got some towers and some um, a fun library at the top with stained glass everywhere. It's yep. also very old and um, is Fun to work on <laughs> as well. It keeps me busy. Yeah. And you work in the energy field. Yeah, I work right. in energy efficiency. So uh -huh. um, I care about resilience. Um, I've gotten into horticultural energy efficiency. So it's kind of fun to combine my interest in growing as well as the work that I do in building science. Yeah. Yeah. So. Nice. Well, cool. we'd love to see your gardens. Yeah, let's yeah. do it. Do we have to go through tour? that door over there, though? <laughs> oh, the hippies, I think they're hanging out inside right now. <laughs> but um, It harkens back side. to an your earlier time I love on that the side, property. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so let's do a tour of your garden. So yeah. uh, you have a bunch of different spots around here, uh, which is really fun. I mean, yeah. It's really nice to have a garden where it's not just all in one place. Yeah, when I bought the house, they said it has like over a dozen perennial beds. And mm -hmm. so... In May time, uh, there's bleeding hearts everywhere oh. here oh, and all nice. along the sides of the barn. Yeah. And they just keep the bumblebees busy in the beginning of the season. <laughs> and then these ferns that you can see, I've kind of cut back because it's the end of the season. Those grow up and um, they're really a lot of wildlife likes hanging out in there. And the na neighborhood oh, cool. cat likes to stalk things. <laughs> <laughs> This is a tree that I took down that used to be um, in the corner of the picket fence right there. Okay. So, uh, an old silver maple that had gotten to its end of its life. And uh -huh. so I've been wow. re reusing it, reusing it yep. in a variety of ways. Repurposing it. That's a great thing to always be able to do. And so, yeah, yet more perennial beds I've been building um, more plants into. Mm -hmm. And then this is a veggie garden that I built out in around 2018. It's about 450 square feet. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it's honestly too big sometimes. Like I, I, I did a bit of traveling this summer. You can see it's a little bit overgrown, but yeah, um, yeah. But it's definitely a lot of fun to try out new 
new varietals, and um, and I'm growing some stuff that I'll tell you more about when we get around to the other side. So right. lots of different things in well, here. Well, that's a common issue with lots of people. We get uh, very excited in the spring, and so we have a big garden, and then mm -hmm. by summer, all these other things start happening. And, and there are those months where you're like, why won't this fill in? It looks <sighs> so, like, the yeah. plants look so small, uh -huh. and then they just shoot up, and, and you're right. overwhelmed. And then by this <laughs> time of year, like, vines are everywhere, and weeds are poking through, and all of that stuff. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, just to remind people, we're looking for your questions, too, here mm -hmm. live in, in, in All Things Gardening. Uh, we're live streaming it on YouTube, so if you have some questions, send them to us. Mary will be the, the question holder there, the question and we can holder. answer all kinds of questions related <laughs> to what you're seeing or what's going on in your garden. Yeah, I have a question, actually. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. mentioned the neighborhood cat. Um, yeah. And I have huge problems in my little garden with critters and things. Mm -hmm. What is it like here? Do you have a lot of wildlife visiting and uh, partaking? <laughs> well, or? yeah, I actually have a couple skunks that I have seen recently. Um, I got compost piles over here that, that are open, so mm -hmm. oh, yeah. there are animals that come and check those out, but nothing super disruptive. I put the, as you can see, the smaller gauge mm -hmm. wire at the bottom there to idea. keep out the chipmunks, mm -hmm. Right. but there has been a chipmunk many different years that knows how to tunnel. Right. So, like, <laughs> right. You can only outsmart them so much. Exactly. You can try as much as you want. Nice thing to do with that uh, small gauge wire is to bury it into the ground. I don't know if you did that. I did a little bit. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Because that way. They probably went a little bit. They deeper. probably went a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So you have a, a bunch of nice squash growing here mm -hmm. um, that are not quite mature yet. And, and it is September. So even in Huntington in September, it can get a little cool. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, one of the things you could do. Uh, with these squashes to get them to mature a little bit faster is to cut back the growth points. Ah. So, uh, for example, you have this watermelon vine mm -hmm. growing up here, and it's a beautiful vine. It's got little baby watermelons on it with some nice flowers, but they're never going to make it. They're yeah. never going to make it. Nah, that's yeah. not going to happen. Yeah. So just cut off the ends. You know, mm -hmm. just snip them off with your fingers or with a pruner, and you mm. can do that with the winter squash you have here, too. And that way True. more energy will go into maturing the squash you have. That makes sense. Yeah. I always hate cutting them back. I know. <laughs> I know, right? It feels like a piece of your soul gets clipped away, right? Uh, I have a question from mm -hmm. Amy. Amy says, something ate all my gooseberry leaves. Will it survive? And what can I do to help it? Oh, Thanks Amy. Thanks for the question, yes, Amy. Yes, gooseberry leaves. So there is an insect called the impor imported currant worm, which goes mm. after gooseberries because they're all related. Mm -hmm. And it was imported uh, from another country. And that's one that will often defoliate gooseberries. So one of the things you want to do is that earlier in the season, so early summer or so, when the gooseberry is looking beautiful and you're thinking nothing's going <laughs> to bad happen to it, uh, that's when you start checking the bottoms of the leaves for some little caterpillars there. Mm. And at that point, you can squish them. That would be one thing you can do. You can spray something on them that would uh, actually knock them down, um, like a spinosad or one of those organic sprays. But you have to do it early in the season because a lot of times by the time it, you see the damage, it's a little too late to do much to it. Okay, next question as we, uh, oh, as we walk around. Yeah, we'll, let's we'll look at some and, more, and more of Gretchen's garden. Uh, Cheryl says Gretchen grows the best peppery arugula. Can you show us where oh, that is? Oh, show us your yeah. peppery arugula. <laughs> I want to taste this. Yeah. It's going kind of, it's, I, I need to be better at they sow, they bloom, you eat them, then you sow again. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, yes. I always forget to do the sow again part. Sow again part, <laughs> so, right, right. Um, here, let's... Uh, a couple of these. Well, arugula is fun because it'll self-sow, too. And yes. You'll see it'll just kind of pop up. Ooh, My friend there. Wallace just visited and said um, that this is acting more like an herb now than a green. Mm. You know, mm. putting it in a chimichurri right. or something Ooh. else to oh, make it. Oh, wow. Right? Mm. Yeah, it kicks. <laughs> so, yeah, wow. That's got a little spice to it. Mm -hmm. mm, I that like tasty. that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But don't well, let it. Cheryl, don't... you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you can see it's bolted, and there's tons yep. and tons of seeds. Mm -hmm. so. And the flowers are edible too. Oh. oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Look at that. You can eat those too. Uh, CJ mm -hmm. says, uh, which are more likely to survive of Vermont winter, mums or asters? Asters, absolutely, mm -hmm. CJ. Uh, Mums have been so hybridized, the ones you see in the garden centers and places like that, that um, they tend not to really overwinter up here. But asters are a tried and true wildflower, and you can get all kinds of different varieties now of different colors and shapes and sizes. Do you have to do anything to protect them to have them overwinter? Nope. Oh, okay. They will just come back. Oh, good to know. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Let's continue. <laughs> yeah. So this is my. Um, different compost piles, my brush pile, mm -hmm. and then my fieldstone patio where I've been planting creeping thyme and other kind of oh, wow. uh, things to block out the grass oh. like a juga. And what's blooming over there? There's my clematis. I trained it up the pole um, oh, for the nice. past few years and it's Great. finally just really just going, going yeah, nuts. Um, 
And so, yeah, I, I, if you can, you know, I highly recommend composting your yard waste. And mm -hmm. the grass actually gets the compost up to, it's right around. Oh, like you've got a thermometer. 85 degrees Fahrenheit right now in there. <laughs> great, just, great. Just from the grass. Keep cranking so, it. Yeah. 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 And you can mix in the grass with some brown materials that you might have, like some mm -hmm. old stuff that you have around, and, and that'll help the whole thing decompose yep. faster. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed on your. Um, Instagram page too do, that you mentioned compost sharing. Can you talk a little bit about that and what that entails? Yeah, I mean it's something that I think now that the Vermont composting law is in effect, mm -hmm. a lot of people are thinking about the need to compost. And so I've been thinking about, and it's not something I've put completely into practice yet, but I put on my Instagram, you know, if people need compost, they can use it. And then also if people had small enough scale, like for example my tenants, they use mm -hmm. this compost as well. So we all build soil with me, you wow. know? Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. Great. So cool. I, yeah. Great idea. If you can, you know, share it with your community. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Well, I, I'd like to go around this little secret path. And, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. you should lead us. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I'm not so, sure where I'm going. <laughs> um, a few years ago, I planted both raspberries um, and uh, two, two varieties of raspberries back here, and one of them really won out, I think. <laughs> and so um, they've grown into the veggie garden, as you can see, and I yes. can't, I don't know, I guess that's a question I could ask you guys. Mm -hmm what's a good way to stop raspberries if not to just you know just keep cutting the runners every time you see them yeah that's probably the best thing you can yeah. do you could try to put edging in you know but you have to go pretty deep to get down low oh, enough yeah so, yeah so like the, the roots don't go underneath it and come mm -hmm. back up but if you can create a pathway somewhere where you could either mow or just easily kind of go through and, and knock them down when they're small yeah. that'll keep them contained you know, that's <laughs> as you the can best tell i do. have not contained them but a lot of animals are happy to have them uh -huh. um a lot of the uh, pollinators including too. human Ooh. beings yeah Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yep so this is the mm. these are ever bearing raspberries by the way these are the ones that produce in the fall and there's two ways to prune these just a minute <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the first way to prune them is to do it like you do with regular raspberries so in the summer you see all these dead canes there you just prune those back the other way to do it is to prune them either this time of year or after they're done, obviously, mm -hmm. or in winter, just cut them up, mow them all down to the ground. Okay. And then they'll come back up, but they won't produce a summer crop, but they'll produce a bigger fall crop. Oh, good to know. So it's nice to have different ways to uh, approach your raspberry crop. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Good to know. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. And then looking back, Gretchen. Yeah. What's happening? Um, so <laughs> this is a uh, wind tower that was installed in the 70s and still wow. is uh, wow. it's in in place today not <laughs> operational today but you can tell that uh, it got a wire running to the oh yeah oh yeah running so to the barn to the house yeah. yep and so and it's got that ladder have you ever tried to climb that ladder? i've thought about it but i think it would be unsafe <laughs> 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 i uh you know i appreciate the previous owner's enthusiasm for renewable energy the house right. has solar hot water and um, used to have a 1990s era solar panel here that was connected to some batteries in the greenhouse okay. to, to run his stereo. To run the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. yeah. Oh, I can see, I can imagine a vine growing up that. I know. I've yeah. thought about you know turning it into something horticultural. But yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. Really nice. And these squash are beautiful. So are these something new for you? Yeah. This is a new variety. Um, there's actually a baker in town um, who's starting a business uh, in. Burlington and uh, she had been operating in Paris for many years and so she was saying that you know I learned in France that they don't actually really have a lot of pumpkins oh. um, for for culinary use yes, and so right. they grow red curry squash mm -hmm. and that's what they find at the supermarket so yeah. I, I tried that for the first time this year and uh -huh. the, the honey nut squash that you see over there are also new this year to me yeah um, I've grown the moon and stars watermelon before and I still only get about one melon a year out of them, so I think I'm still learning with but those. But it's a special occasion when that melon's ripe. Right, yeah, right? I mean, I'm still trying to get it to taste good too, so you know, like, oh, yeah. Yeah, there's good. that part too. Yeah, yeah. nice. Well, What's these, your, oh sorry, okay. I was gonna ask what your recipe, go-to recipe is for some of the squash that you've got growing here. I definitely think with honey nut, it's just the tried and true simple stuff, cutting it in half, scooping the insides yeah. out, and then just a little maple syrup and olive oil mm -hmm. and roast, roast it, it in the oven. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. It, it's just a very versatile squash. I, 
there's it's a very trendy squash too, so there's a lot of <laughs> recipes right. for it right now. Yeah, yeah those, those butternut squash are great too because they don't get the squash vine borer, which I don't oh. know if you've had an issue with that or not. I have not. I've had the squash beetles, the little yes. yellow and black striped ones, mm -hmm. but what, what does the borer look like? Uh, the borer is a fly that lays an egg right on the base of the squash plant, and the egg hatches into a, a green or a white worm, mm. white caterpillar, mm -hmm. and it tunnels its way through the stem. And so in the middle of the summer, all of a sudden your beautiful big squash stem just wilts and dies. I saw someone in the garden group that I'm in, uh, you know, they thought they'd watered it fine. They came out the next day and it looked completely dead. Yep. And, and they were like, it's not about watering. It's that so, you've got a borer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you want to be junior scientists, what you could do is get a knife and just cut along that stem away from the center all the way out. Find and eventually you're going to find that big, fat, juicy, white caterpillar. <laughs> and if you remove it, will you be able to salvage that squash? You can sometimes. If oh, you can remove okay. it, or there's usually a couple of them, and then just bury that stem in soil, then it'll re-root itself. Mm. Good to know. Or just grow butternut squash because for <laughs> yeah. some reason they don't like butternut squash. Hmm. That's, that's very helpful. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you chose wisely. Yeah, no, I just chose it because I really like how they taste. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and these sunflowers are beautiful too. Yeah, yeah, I get a few of them. Um, Fedco Seeds does some nice different varieties of heirloom mm -hmm. sunflowers. I like the like teddy bear ones and the kind of maroon faced ones. Yeah. And do you save the seeds from them or you just let them do their thing? I mostly let the animals have them. It's mm -hmm. kind of fun to watch. Yeah. Uh, the little, what are the yellow and black goldfinches like hanging upside Gold, down, yeah, right, eating right. the sunflowers mm -hmm. out of it. Uh -huh. like I saw a red acrobats. squirrel sitting yeah. on one. <laughs> right. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Before we move on from squash land, uh, oh, Susan okay. asks, okay. Uh, how do you know when they're ready to pick butternut ah, squash? Ah, the butternut squash or any winter squash. Yeah. yeah, so it's a good question, Susan. So what you'd want to do is uh, wait till it turns the mature color. So it's mm -hmm. kind of nice to know that a butternut squash kind of usually is a tan color or a curry squash is a red or an mm -hmm. orange color. And then you can just press the skin a little bit with your thumb. And if you could still make a little indentation with your thumb, with your thumbnail, don't press it really hard, just, you know, soft. <laughs> you don't want to have all these indentations in your squash. Um, that means that it, it's not quite ready yet. But if you can press it and you get a nice resistance, then you can harvest it and bring it inside. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Uh, one more question from Joanne. I have a well-established blue Baptista, mm. which, as always, it bloomed and had here. seed oh, you pods. Do. Oh, let's go see your, your Baptista. Oh, Baptisia. Yeah. Uh, this summer, no flowers, but healthy foliage. Any ideas why? Uh, so did your Baptisia bloom this year? Yes. Uh, Gretchen? I got it last year. Yeah. So it had blooms when I bought it, and then it came back with blooms. So okay. Fingers crossed year three. Oh, nice. Great, yeah. great. Uh, so the reason why it's it may not um, actually flower for you is probably more related to sun than anything else. Uh, because they, they like a full sun location, so you can have some oh. shade here, mm -hmm. but you obviously must have enough sun perhaps coming up in the east. Is yep, that morning the... sun all the way up to here, right. and then things go behind a ridge a little bit, but then the sun comes through kind of just comes for through a little bit more. little alley that just way. A little bit at yeah, the end, yeah, so that's probably enough to, to have it um, come up and flower. It's an early flower in perennials, so a lot of times mm -hmm. um, it'll come out and start flowering even before a lot of the leaves are, are fully out yet Yeah, for, for shade. So I would say... Here for Susan to make sure you um, have a, a lot of sun on it. That's usually the key thing. And don't move it. Baptisia does not like to be moved. It has a, a tap root, hmm. and when you dig down, sometimes you move it, and it doesn't really survive. And you hit that, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Nice. Good to know. So I wanted to, before we leave the vegetable garden, just point out one other thing, that tall plant over by the sunflowers. Yes. What is that? <laughs> These are sun chokes. So um, if, if you've ever been to the grocery store and you kind of see something that looks like a knobbly potato, yeah. um, that's what a sunchoke looks like. It's a Jerusalem artichoke is another name for it. And I, I had no idea they grew this tall, but uh -huh. it's, this is the, the sunniest part of the garden. It's not shaded by the locust. It gets that afternoon sun the whole day. Yeah. And so they're literally like 12, 10, maybe 10 feet tall at right. least. Yeah. And you said you used to eat them in California. Yeah, I used to get them in a CSA box. So um, mm -hmm. I had a friend in a garden group who we were doing a trade, and she was like, oh, if you want some sun chokes, you could probably transplant them. And, yeah. and I will say, transplanting them, they looked very sad. Like, I, I had to use some, you know, <laughs> some of those green wire stands uh -huh. to hold them up because they were very upset at first. But yeah. they, they bounced back, nice. as you can see. <laughs> so you're going to harvest some of these when the fall comes? I will. Yeah. I will, yeah. And I'm um, still... One thing I was going to ask you guys is, like... <laughs> 
pruning tomatoes, I you can tell I just don't do it, but I just wanted to show this as an example of like if you don't prune, this is what an indeterminate tomato, right? Yes, this is an indeterminate, it's sun so, gold. So it never decided where to stop. Right, well, it, it never wants to stop. Mm -hmm. It just wants to keep growing and mm -hmm. growing. Yeah, so for something like this, this is another one, just like with the squash, this time of year, cut the uh, to cut those little bits like right here, for example, if you don't mind me. Mm, go doing, please, yeah. yeah no, you just you know, snip this right off. That's, that's all you want to do, even this, because yeah. this is not going to have enough time to flower mm -hmm. or fruit. But something like this, you know, depending on the fall we're getting, you probably will get these to actually mature. Mm -hmm. um, that's the nice thing about a cherry tomato is that they're very fast growing and you get a lot of fruit out of them and they'll just keep growing and growing and growing until someone makes them stop. <laughs> yeah, or the snow does. Yeah. Or the snow does, right. Yeah. Do so, those, the, okay. uh, if you pick the green ones, put them on your windowsill, do those ripen? No, no. they have to have some color. That's okay. the whole key thing. So if it has a little bit of color, even if it's just a little bit of color, yeah. then you can bring them in into a warm area. It doesn't need sunlight, but okay. it needs warmth, mm. and then they'll mature. But if they stay green, you can make fried green tomatoes or something, yeah. like green relish, like, whatever. Yeah, green salsa. <laughs> green yeah. salsa, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So this area over here, uh, Gretchen, uh, was was a mess, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, um, so gout weed is something that I think it was an ornamental that people liked. Yes. And then they didn't really realize how pervasive it can spread. And mm -hmm. so this is an area where um, I worked with my gardener, Meg, and we sheet mulched this whole area. Okay. And so that's what made it possible to even have these plantings. Oh, right. Um, so I think we sheet mulched this area last year, and then we uh -huh. did some more this spring. And so... Uh, you can tell there's not gout weed everywhere, but it does come back. So that's oh, yeah. why we, it's a tough plant. That's why we had to do some this spring. So could you explain what sheet mulching is? Yeah. Um, sheet mulching is a cheap way to build out beds and to tamp down grass so uh -huh. that you can have soil to plant whatever you want in. And so right. um, the concept of creating sheets of cardboard, compost, and mulch Mm -hmm. to essentially suffocate and bury down whatever's underneath it right. and also be moist enough and warm enough to break down the cardboard and sort of make um, make your own soil. So instead yeah, yeah. of having to buy this much soil, which can get expensive, you can mm. buy less and, and kind of make it go farther. Cool. Mm. So this was done last year. Is, is there any evidence of cardboard still in there? Yeah, Meg, where, where were you? some of the evidence areas? Yeah. Right here. Oh, nice. Okay. So you can see oh, we yeah. have. So you can see there's a little cardboard left. We can see how moist the soil yeah. is. Yeah, right. and how how deteriorated the cardboard is getting after right. just a year. And it doesn't and really stop the plants from growing. It's just. Yeah, and I don't actively irrigate this area, mm -hmm. so this is just from rain. Um, okay. Whatever it gets, it breaks things down. Yeah. Right. So it's made this whole area just much more attractive. To, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. To do more planting and mm -hmm. put other things yeah. in there. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's such a, a tempting thing to do. I think it'd be really nice just to kind of do a little demonstration, kind of show ah, people how to do yeah. a little sheet mulching. It's that easy. Yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> that easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just to remind you, this is All Things Gardening. We are live at Gretchen's house here in Huntington, and we're doing a tour, but we're also answering your gardening questions. So just type them in there. Mary will get them, and she'll interrupt us, and we'll be able to answer your questions. <laughs> It's a friendly interruption. It's a friendly interruption. It's a, it's a flow. We it's just a flow. do a full flow. So sheet mulching, this is almost the same sort of practice that you teach to do no-dig gardening. Yes, beds. it's a very similar yeah. thing. Yeah. Some okay. people call it lasagna gardening right. where you put mm -hmm. layers. Yep. You can put many different layers on, mm -hmm. or you can just simply put cardboard and mulch on. Yeah, this is the most basic of the mm -hmm. lasagnas. Um, <laughs> as you can tell when we were back lasagna. in the compost area, I don't have any active ready-to-go compost. My yep. co my compost is new cooking and uh -huh. probably will freeze over the winter <laughs> and then start <laughs> cooking again in the spring. Yep. But um, from what I know, Charlie, right, like the enemy of most trees is grass. Yes. So exactly. I planted this tree and mm -hmm. you can see I gave mm. it a little bit of a, in some area, but right. it's been small for a while, probably mm -hmm. because it doesn't have that much energy to keep fighting the grass. Right. right. It is, the roots are so small, they, they can't really com out compete the grass for water and for nutrients. That's why when you have a tree like this, you should have a really big ring going around it. So that's what we're going to do. And that's what you're going <laughs> to yeah. do. Yeah. And you have someone to help you too. Yes. Yeah, so Meg started helping me last year and um, you're the, is it the groundskeeper of the Huntington Open Women's Land, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, why don't you tell me a bit about how you've been doing sheet mulching? Um, so I started doing sheet mulching, um, doing urban agriculture. I've uh, been working in Chicago for a while, and the soil there is, of course, contaminated and shallow and um, terrible. And an easy way for us to build new beds would be to start with things that were free. 
lots of cardboard <laughs> from grocery stores and places where the cardboard is you know, considered kind of food safe. You don't want anything impregnated with weird chemicals. Um, and just lay down uh, several layers of cardboard. If you've got compost, put that down. Um, whatever organic material you've got and wood chip we were able to get for free, we could put that down. Um, and it's basically just a way to, to seal the soil and start over and keep rebuilding. Um, so then moving to Vermont, there are a lot of weeds growing up everywhere I'm working. <laughs> yeah. It's very lush, and this is a, an easy way to keep all those weeds down. Um, and we just collect the cardboard and yeah. lay it down. You can cut it to the shapes that you want. And you want to use cardboard, as Meg was saying, corrugated cardboard, and not paperboard. Paperboard yeah. is like cereal mm -hmm. boxes. That has chemicals and things in it. You want something like this uh, material to use. And you want it to overlap by a few inches mm -hmm. as well. So if we're making a circle coming out of radiating from the tree, we'll kind of keep puzzle piecing right. mm -hmm. the cardboard together. It doesn't it, have to be perfect, really. Yeah. Does it have to go right up next to the trunk or no? Where, where's we're this? basically trying to get up to where the grass and yeah, the right. mulch okay. end. Yep. Yeah. And you can see there's a little creeping Charlie and stuff yep. in there too. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that you don't make it too thick because you then you can create an anaerobic environment underneath right. it. So usually two layers maximum mm -hmm. um, is going to be a good way to go. I often get asked if um, the ink is a problem. Most ink is going to be soy-based at this point because it's cheaper than mm. chemical-based mm -hmm. ink, so it's actually safe for your soil. Yeah. Um, take off any plastic tape, but that's about it. Yeah, yeah. tape and staples. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Anything that feels like a laminated box, though, mm -hmm. like yeah. the big ones from Costco, those have gotten, those have plasticized coatings on mm. them. Right. And then, like, a cereal box also has kind of yeah. too many paints and also a coating on the outside. Exactly, yeah. yeah. The thing about cardboard is it's much better than landscape fabric. You know, that's something that really people have gotten away from using much. It was originally put in there so that it would keep weeds away, but then uh, over time, weeds would start coming in the top of it and growing. And what it really does is it inhibits the growth of the plants because mm -hmm. it doesn't let allow gas and air to e exchange in water to get down mm. into the roots. Cardboard is, is, does that same thing a little bit, but not as bad. And then after, as we've seen, a year or so, it breaks down and so the tree is able to continue growing. Another thing that's great about it is it can really help slow down erosion and keep the nutrients and the water right where you want them. Mm -hmm. And the earthworms love it. And if you can draw those earthworms in, then you're bringing them in to help with your composting and help uh, put an extra nutrients in your soil. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so we just covered yeah. with some... Um... So we pretend, let's have, we have a perfect circle of <laughs> cardboard, right? So <laughs> Kind of a perfect circle. Like. And then, you know, what we could do is probably just wheel this over. Or just dump it in there. And just kind of dump it on there right. and spread it out. So you could, this is just regular um, bark mulch you had dumped yeah, here? Yeah, this is a cedar cedar mulch mm -hmm. that I had delivered at the beginning of the season. Yep. And, yeah. So it's nothing uh, complicated. And this will completely cut down on your weeding time. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and you, you want to do probably, what, a three to four inch thick layers? is At least on top. two inches, At yes. At least two inches, yeah. Yeah, and if you mm -hmm. have a mix of mulch and compost, you want to do a lasagna, maybe a couple inches right. of one and then a couple inches of another. Yeah, and you don't want to, don't want to have it up against the trunk. Don't want to suffocate it. But right. <laughs> yeah, what about the volcano mulching thing? Right. Was, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't want to do that. Yeah. And this mulch is great too, but you also if you have a, you know, an arborist mm. um, who is just working in the area or something, you know, feel free to go up to them and say, you know, do you need a place to dump your chips? because chips are even better than the shredded mulch because they have a lot more air spaces between them. The water gets in easier, the air gets in easier, and you, you have less of that matting that sometimes will happen mm. with this kind oh, of mulch. Oh, good to know. Yeah. yeah. So Wendy writes in to say you've done a beautiful job with your space. I love all the nooks and crannies. <laughs> Thank you. And Edible Brattleboro says your local bike store has got some great boxes for sheet mulching. There yeah. you go, all right? Yes. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's why we love you guys. Yes. All and Things Gardening here live streaming <laughs> at Gretchen's house in Huntington. We've talked about her vegetable garden. We've talked about sheet composting and sheet mulching. Now we're going to go to another cool technique over here that both Meg and Gretchen put together last year. Yeah. So show us what this thing is. <laughs> so I was reading about permaculture and learning about different strategies that people all over the world have used. And I don't even remember where it was I came across it, but the word hugel culture came <laughs> into my life. And uh -huh. I saw this cool diagram of a tree being buried in 
you know, compost and grass and brushes and then creating this whatever shape you really want raised bed. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, I want to reduce the amount of grass I have, build more places for animal habitat, pollinators, food growing and so on. And when I actually brought Meg on, um, I chose to do so because I was going through a lot of life stuff and with, as you can see, the amount of space here, it can really <laughs> overgrow you too. So yeah. when I brought Meg on, one of the things that I found so great was that she had already had experience doing hugel culture um, in, her, in her youth with her dad, right? Um, yeah, and, and professionally, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, so when I mentioned I wanted to build one, we have, as you can see, the silver maple behind us that I uh, had taken down and and then we chainsawed more of it. And, um, and so the reason why it's here is I had planted a couple of these blackberry and blueberry bushes that you see and made this sort of, we sheet mulched the circle. And so that was the first thing we did last year. And then this spring, this May, we chopped up the wood and we built the cross that you see underneath there. And it's really a cross just because it fits in between the four berry bushes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, we talked about the shape and, and yeah. that you'd be able to kind of have all these different sides, like east, west, north, south. Mm -hmm. um, right, right. It really is kind of like a compass. Um, and uh, as you can see, a bunch of volunteers in the compost that we put on here, all the tomatoes. There's what looks that. like a hybridized zucchini-ish sort of squash on the other weird side. weird squash over there, yeah, yeah. And so this is its first year being a hugel, uh -huh. and um, and then next year we'll be a bit more intentional about what we plant, and we'll probably train the berries to, to be a bit more, rather than octopuses, kind of, <laughs> like, right, right. <laughs> have more of an arch. So you, you made this right on top of the ground and, and built it up. You know, mm -hmm. you can also make it as a trench, you know, dig a trench and do it that way. Yeah. And then you put the logs down uh, and, and made them up maybe, what, three feet tall or so? Mm -hmm. And then just covered it all with compost. Yeah, I'm going to stand next to Meg so she can t tell a little bit. <laughs> oh, you can tell <laughs> yeah. us all about it. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that Gretchen has, as you saw in the back, is some fabulous compost and a lot of brush from a lot, a lot of, of trees that came down. <laughs> so one of the things we needed to figure out was what to do with all this stuff. So putting, we first put down the big logs and then started collecting the smaller brush together. Um, because we were building so tall, to make it more structurally sound, it's easier to gather the brush together and tie it with twine, as you would if you were mm -hmm. making thatch, mm -hmm. and stack those in, and then keep adding layers of compost in between, sort of like mortar. Otherwise, you have a lot of airspace between mm -hmm. the brush and yeah. rodents get in there, and, mm -hmm. and you lose a lot of soil. Um, so we're just stacking first the big logs, some soil, the brush. Um, we had a bunch of leaves that went in, a lot of grass clippings, mm -hmm. kitchen waste, you know, anything that's organic. So you're layering um, your carbon rich and your nitrogen rich um, kinds of things. So you're creating basically a living compost pile yeah. that you're planting in. Mm -hmm. and, and then the trees decompose over time and and uh, the, you were saying it's kind of self-watering as well. Yeah, the, the big trees, especially at the bottom, are going to act like a sponge. They're going to hold a lot of the water and then release that slowly as the roots draw on it. Same thing with the nutrients. They're going to hold all the nutrients from the compost and then release those as the plants need it. So it becomes really drought resistant, but also because it's raised up, it's also going to be fairly flood resistant. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. going to warm itself as that compost is decomposing. So it's going to be able to grow earlier in the spring and later into the fall. Um, and it's just basically going to feed and water itself, and you just put some things in it and walk away, come back yeah. for food. <laughs> and you can yeah. use uh, pretty much any kind of wood as long as it's not something like walnut or cedar or something. Okay. Or pine, with, you were saying. Or pines. Yeah. Don't yeah. want to put your Christmas trees hard. in there. Right. Yeah. We had a lot of Christmas trees back there, but <laughs> we, did, we didn't say, put like, them in there. Yeah. The blueberries <laughs> love that acid, but otherwise, yeah, no black walnut, no buckthorn. Both mm. of those have chemicals in mm. that are going to um, inhibit the growth of other plants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So keep those out of there. Right. But yeah. otherwise, it could be oak and it could be alder, it could be apple, it could be all kinds of mm -hmm. different yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. That's great. It's a great way to hide things. You mentioned my dad. That's what he to do is, <laughs> just he was German, we just collected all the yard waste. <laughs> yeah, just make a hugel. And made, made yeah. more hills. Nice. So, yeah. probably make more. Uh, Cheryl says, I'm surprised how quickly plants took over the hugel mound. Yeah. Is that kind of how it usually goes? Well, if, especially if you use on. compost yeah. <laughs> uh, that has uh, seeds in it from last year or whenever. Right. Um, yeah, th that can happen that way. And um, I've seen hugel mounds that are built and, and even bigger than this, and within one year they have vines growing on. They planted squash usually on the top of them, mm -hmm. and just kind of let them kind of grow down. And in a year, the whole thing is covered. It's just yeah. a big mound of squash. I, w I was surprised. I thought that, you know, I told you when you came to visit last yeah. time, I was like, yeah, maybe maybe I'll have planted things in the hugel. And I was like, oh, it planted itself. It planted <laughs> so, itself. Yeah. Yeah. So that being said, what do you want to plant there next year? 
Well, um, you know, the veggie garden is a little bit farther away from my kitchen yeah. than a kitchen garden. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking of doing more edibles and herbs over here as well. Okay. And experimenting with, you know, some of the things that maybe haven't done super well over there and trying them here. Mm -hmm. Maybe they'll get better sun. Maybe they won't be as choked out by other things. Yeah. Um, so you can see I'm growing tomatoes and squash here. I'll probably do some tomatoes in here. <laughs> um, and uh, just have some fun with some different varietals like I usually do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've even seen people put shrubs and trees on them, yeah. especially if you're using big logs because the, the mound will oh, be yeah. there for 10, 20 years. Yeah, yeah that's Could exactly. you do potatoes in, in a hugel mound? Sure, yeah. as long yeah. as you have enough soil for them. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. You bury them with some more mulch. Yeah. Because you, you were saying your potatoes didn't do so hot in the regular garden? I've never done potatoes, okay. so the sun chokes ah. are my first tuber, oh, tuber style. Tubers. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah, but maybe yeah. I'll try that. Mm. Yeah, yeah you might want to avoid corn. That might yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get a little tall. Corn is so popular right now, though. <laughs> yes, it is very popular right now. Yeah, so um, folks out there, if you uh, have tried hugel culture or if you're interested in hugel culture, send us a message while we're chatting about it because we'd be happy to talk more about hugel culture, how to set up a mound, or like I said, set up a trench, which makes mm -hmm. it a little bit lower, a little bit more manageable. It's the same idea. You're just digging down, and all the stuff you dig down, you just put right back on top mm. of the hugel I've heard mound. of people doing it inside a raised bed as well. If you buy a raised bed and you yep. think about how expensive that would be to fill with just pure soil, right. you can put some brush and a couple of larger twigs or branches maybe not an entire tree mm -hmm. but yeah like yeah, if yeah. you put them in your raised bed that can be a way to save on soil yeah mm -hmm. exactly the thing about building it into a mound too is you can versus flat you can think about what you need in your space and how much space you have if you have um, the flat bed you're only going to get that footprint worth of growing space as soon as you raise it up you're going to be multiplying how much space you've got mm -hmm. so something else to exactly. think about and yeah. also creating microclimates mm -hmm. of places that are in shadow places that get more water places that get less so you just figure out which one works best for your, yeah. your spot and a lot of good visual interest too so all of a sudden yeah. you just don't have a flat yard you've got these mounds it's kind of cool thing to look at i definitely notice animals like to be on top of it you know so like <laughs> the, the robin will come and look for worms from on top on of top. it yeah, and yeah. Um, so it becomes a you know kind of like a wildlife attraction too sure yeah sure well, here's a couple of questions for you guys. Uh, Ren writes, should I cut back my pollinator wildflowers mm. or not before the end of the well, season? Well, Ren, you're very um, right on top of the program because we're going to go talk <laughs> about perennials in a minute. Uh, what you want to do is the kind of thinking has changed around that. You know, the traditional thing was always to cut back all your perennials in the fall, clean it all up, take all those perennials out of there. But now the thinking is to leave it all and literally don't even cut it back. Just leave everything there until the spring. And the reason is there's a lot of pollinators and there's a lot of beneficial insects that are overwintering in the stems and in that leaf layer that's there on the soil. So if you leave it there till the spring, till you get about four or five days of 50 degree temperatures, that means that by then they've moved on to their other homes and then you can clean up your garden. So that's a bit of a stretch for people because I know people like that nice, clean look. Especially in stick season. And especially yeah. in stick season. Yeah. But if you can overcome that propensity to have the nice, clean look, uh, and it actually has a, it has a, a romantic kind of feel to mm. it, I think, mm -hmm. in, the, in the fall and the winter with all the stems and especially seed heads like echinacea mm. and rudbeckias mm -hmm. and things like that. But leave it till the spring. That would be the best thing. Okay. Let's keep walking, maybe, and okay, talk well, about some beautiful flowers. Okay, well, let's talk about perennials. Flowers. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the house came with a lot of perennials, including these hostas, the ferns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I added those, mm -hmm. I don't remember what they're called. Lamb's last ears. Lamb's, Lamb's ears, ears, but they are perennials as well. Super fun to pet. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yes, they are. And then this is a hyssop, which is really fun to smell. Mm -hmm. So if wow. you, um, you, know, yeah. you kind of get an aromatic when you um, take a look at it. And I also like the color. Yeah. Um, I planted this tree a couple years ago. Um, it's a seven sun tree. What did you say the scientific name? Heptacodium. Mm -hmm. And this is a really cool tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, maybe we can talk about it in a second. Um, some other uh, perennials in here, like the, um, what's the pink one? The, it's like a... It's a little barberry? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, like a pink berry, but it's like one of those like genetic... Oh, like a coral berry? Yes. Yes. That's one of those. It. Okay. And mm -hmm. then the one that's just finished... I also don't remember the name of it, but it's a nice one that um, is nice. The shrub right here? Yeah. Yeah, the clethora. Yeah, it's yeah. nice and fragrant. Um, mm -hmm. Bees like it at the end of the year. Yeah, so butterflies like end it of too. The season. Yep. But yeah, so the, the perennials just keep going. I've planted peonies, mm -hmm. lilies, of course. Lily of the Valley grows over here. Uh huh. Um, but yeah. 
Um, if you want to tell us a little more about this tree, I don't actually know that much about it. I just uh -huh. liked it because they said, you know, it blooms late and yep. it has interesting bark. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not something you normally see. It's a kind of a rare tree. It's from China. Um, it's called Heptacodium or Seven Suns. Seven Suns, that name, I think, is a translation of the Chinese name of this tree, actually. Um, it's also called a seven flower tree because if you look at the flower clusters, they tend to uh, accumulate it in the number seven. <laughs> and uh, what's beautiful about it, is, as Gretchen was mentioning, is that it flowers really late. You know, there's not a lot of other trees that are flowering this time of year. And not only does it flower late, it has a beautiful fragrance to it. Oh, I love this. Mm -hmm. It's subtle, it's soft, it's like, oh, I just went to a little Parisian perfumery. Yeah, it smells like something you would have in a perfume. It does, yeah. it smells exactly like that. And uh, these flowers will bloom this time of year in September, early, mid-September, eventually becoming purple and blue berries, which mm -hmm. of course the birds will really love. Um, and it's a tree that's hardy to zone five, so in Huntington you're probably stretching it a bit. Oh yeah, I was I was stretching it when I bought it, but I was like, we'll see, yeah. <laughs> You'll find out, because <laughs> yeah. Huntington's more like a zone four or five oh, kind yeah. of thing. Oh yeah, it's survived but a couple things years. Are changing. <laughs> <laughs> things are getting warmer so mm -hmm. you know, it's worth a try it could be a multi-stem tree or a single trunk tree it gets 15 to 20 feet tall ultimately so not too big it's a nice one for a small tree in the yard and then once all the leaves drop in the fall the bark exfoliates and you have this kind of tan colored bark that just peels back relieve, uh, revealing this darker tan colored bark underneath it so it looks really cool in the winter too yeah. so I applaud you. You're really just like <laughs> working outside the envelope here with these trees. Yeah. It's a beautiful one. Yeah, it, it's nice after taking this big tree down, thinking about something that would fill in this space. So mm -hmm. putting in some more peonies and then giving this one for more height. I planted it at probably a little bit too close to the mock orange that it's next to. Yeah, yes. But the uh -huh. mock orange is losing, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, well, but. a lot of this too, you know, it's a multi-stem tree right now. So mm -hmm. you could actually prune off some of those side stems, turn it more into a single or double stem hmm. tree mm -hmm. and kind of narrow it a little bit. You know, True. it's young enough that you could do that. You said it was maybe three or four years yeah, old. Yeah, just three years old, I think. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. So I, I think you could still kind of shape it. Mm -hmm. um, but this time of year is not really the time of year to do a lot of pruning. No, I'm going to enjoy it while it's doing yeah, thing. Enjoy, yeah, definitely enjoy it while it's flowering. But also, even if it wasn't flowering, if you prune this time of year, especially shrubs and trees, you're going to stimulate new growth. And oh. that's not what they want to be doing. They're, they're going into their dormancy period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So really, you should wait till at least like December or so before you start pruning. And then you can prune all winter. Mm, okay. Which is not always nice. No. To prune. no. <laughs> <laughs> but it's best for the plants. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you have some beautiful plants here. And you have these um, hydrangeas that probably came with the property, I guess. Yes, yes. <laughs> like there's these two monsters at the very front in that bed, and then there's this one and the ones that don't grow all along here. Mm -hmm. You might have seen some back by the compost as well. Yeah. And they're all very large, like very bushy. Uh -huh. But, and when I bought the house, there were more flowers, more mop heads. Yeah. And now what I get is like, like this. Right. And then you can see there's some big mop heads, but they're all green. Like no, they don't no, really get white. Don't get white, and I'm. Yeah. I don't know what the variety of hydrangea is. Mm -hmm. I know that you're supposed to prune hydrangeas differently depending on the variety. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, um, yeah, I'm just not really sure what to do because they just get so gigantic that they shade out this area, and right. um, they're not doing what makes them fun, which is you know. The yeah, nice turning those blossoms. big puppy blossoms. It's yeah. kind of it cascades down. So these are all the arborescence type of hydrangeas, mm -hmm. and that's one that blooms on new wood. New wood meaning what comes out of the ground or okay. comes off the stem mm -hmm. um, from the from the new year in the spring. So these are the kind of hydrangeas where you can actually just whack them all back. Yeah. Uh, cut them all back down to the ground. They'll come right back up again. And if it feels like it's getting to be a little overwhelming, mm -hmm. which it kind of sounds like, yeah. It, yeah. Um, it might be something good to do. You could do that this winter if you like. Mm -hmm. Just cut them all back down. Um, they will come back up from their root system and they will hopefully flower a little bit lower, closer mm -hmm. to the ground. And because you've cut them back and maybe put some of your nice compost on them too, oh, yeah. they'll actually flower better. You'll get bigger blooms and, and nice white colored blooms to them. Uh, and they won't look as kind of scraggly as they do <laughs> yeah, now. They definitely are looking a little scraggly. <laughs> Everything looks a little scraggly this time yeah, of year, so yeah. you're not alone. I was wondering, another thing that looks kind of scraggly is my lilacs this yes. year. I don't know what happened, really. Um, I can't tell if they're dehydrated or if mm -hmm. something got to them, but like certain you can see 
certain ones further back are mm. e extra crispy. <laughs> and then extra certain, crispy. And then certain lilacs are untouched, you know, yeah. Yeah. not dealing with right. anything. So. And that could be a varietal thing. Uh, certain varieties are more tolerant to diseases than others, mm -hmm. um, or nor more tolerant to this uh, dry condition, which we have had. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this, it's hard to say what exactly this kind of disease is. Um, that's on the tree and usually when things die back along the edge of the leaf it's usually a water issue of some type mm -hmm. but it could have been a fungus it could yeah. be a number of things it could even be powdery mildew which lilacs often will get yeah i saw some powderiness on one of them actually that one over there so that's right. good to know yeah 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 so there's really not much you have to do about this because lilacs are such a tenacious plant yeah. they will just keep coming back they're already making more growth points it's actually kind of funny you know you can see the buds here yes so. oh yeah they're oh, all wow, set yeah. you know any of these spring flowering shrubs have set their buds for next year already mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so the forsythias and the wajilas and the lilacs and the spirea uh, brighter leaf spirea and, and a number of those spring flowering shrubs you don't want to prune them because you're pruning off flowers and you can yeah. actually see these little buds here it could be flower buds for next year oh good to know yeah yeah <laughs> so uh, i don't know if you're concerned about the height of these it yeah, looks well, like so you've cut them down a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so it's kind of funny. Um, last November, they were by, like getting to be, you know, you can see some of them over there, like 12, 14 feet tall. So yeah. tall, you can't prune them at the end of the season. And uh -huh. so I had had someone come in and, and cut them back. But then we got some spring snow mm -hmm. in early s this spring, and it weighed them all down. Oh, so this yeah, is yeah. actually all from being weighed down. Uh-huh. Um, and then I think what happened too is we got heavy rain when they had flowers on them. Yeah. So the flowers weighed them down too, and they just got they just they're arched got now. Arched. <laughs> they have that arched kind of look. And they to don't them. seem like they're going to spring back. It seems like no. this is the shape they are now. Yeah, this is how they are. <laughs> well, sometimes what you can do with uh, lilacs is really cut them way back. Mm. Uh, to rejuvenate them and mm -hmm. you could do it a couple ways you could just be one of those all or nothing people yes. it's just like i'm going to cut them all down to a couple feet tall and then they're going to grow back up and we're going to start over and i'm going to wait two or three years before they actually flower again yeah or you could do what we call a rotational pruning mm -hmm. so that's where you would take a look at like this patch here that we have you could see there's some older stems older branches and trunks there mm -hmm. and there's some younger ones yes. so you take out a third every year so maybe you take out a couple of those big ones back there and i take them out meaning taking them down to a couple feet off the ground yep and what that'll do is stimulate sucker growth from the stump mm -hmm. as well as sucker growth from all around the plant itself yeah and those suckers will be your your future branches your future stems that'll grow up and flower for you and in the process of doing that a third a year after three years you reduce the total height but now you have a whole another hedge of lilacs coming up that's good to know. Yeah, when I bought the house, I actually was looking at it on Google Maps, and mm -hmm. they must have driven by right after someone did that. Yeah. And so it was just looked like, like Frankenstein, <laughs> just yeah, like yeah, yeah. cut yeah. everything off. Right. Yeah. So, but um, it's good to know that they can bounce back, like after something drastic oh, yeah. like that. Exactly. Yeah. You can even cut them down to the ground, and most of them, as long as they're not a specialty kind of hybrid that's very uh, tender, um, yeah. they'll they'll come back. And these lo all look like the species types, the Syringa vulgaris type. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you have problems with your lilacs or your hydrangeas or your clethora, uh, you can just um, send a little chat to Mary and she'll uh, give us a question. Yeah, actually, uh, Geo has a question. You may have sort of touched on it just okay. now when you were chatting with Gretchen. Um, he says if you're waiting to trim a lilac tree that was damaged by some heavy snow, mm. uh, when should you do it? How much should you prune? Should you do it before winter? The yeah, timing of that. Yeah, the mm -hmm. timing of that. So it all depends on the kind of damage. So if you had really bad damage, like there's branches like falling off and really tore the, the bark, I would clean those up anytime. So you want to cut back to a side branch or at least try to clean up the cut so it's nice and smooth. That way it's going to heal much faster. But if it's more just things are leaning over, like, <laughs> like you were this, talking yeah. about, yeah, and, and it's not really broken, it's just kind of leaning, it would be better to wait till the winter to, to do that um, and then cut it off. Of course, anything you cut off, though, for these spring flowering shrubs, you're not going to get flowers um, on those branches you cut or that area. So you just have to kind of be willing to sacrifice that. Mm. Here's a question from Ash. Ash is four years old. Oh, nice. And Ash says, we have a big garden. We've mm -hmm. got sunflowers and pumpkins. And I also like Gretchen's Totoro and Cat Bus tattoo. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ash. I appreciate that. Yeah, she's from, tuning into the yep, tattoos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, from My Neighbor Totoro, right? Yes. Yeah. Hayao Miyazaki movies. I yeah. love that. Oh, nice. Um, there's a couple other questions from folks who are writing in. Uh, mm -hmm. Joan in Plymouth, Vermont. Okay is wondering about planting some potatoes. Uh, Joan mm -hmm. writes, I mm -hmm. planted them for the first time, shallow planted them, then I covered them with hay. 
when do I know when to harvest them? <laughs> ah, yes. So uh, you would harvest those potatoes when the tops start dying back. And uh, the only caveat I would say is that if you notice mice and vole activity, mm. I'd harvest them right now. <laughs> because they're probably munching away your potatoes. Uh, but that deep mulching is a technique you can use for potatoes where you don't have to actually create a trench. You just you know, put the potatoes literally right on the ground. You put a bunch of mulch on top of it and you keep mulching it as they grow up and keep it watered. And you get these potatoes that form in the mulch. And so they're not in the soil. They grow a little bit better. There's a little more air circulation growing through them. Um, it was made famous by Ruth Stout in Connecticut back in the 1970s, mm. uh, deep mulching. So uh, that yeah. is a kind of a cool technique to use. One more question. Charlie sure. Retta writes, my Baptisia is huge. Back to the Baptisia. Yeah. Um, Retta says hers is large. I know it doesn't uh, look, uh, oh, sorry. I know it doesn't like its roots disturbed, um, but how do I keep it tame um, oh. <laughs> okay. of growing enormous? Yeah, it, it does slowly expand. It's not going to be something like a bee bomb that just goes out and has all these little shoots all over the place. It's more going to be, be the, the clump gets bigger and bigger. So at some point, you can kind of slice that clump and, and slice the edges of it and perhaps get enough of the root system where you can actually move it and get another plant out of it. But it has to be you know, a big enough clump to do that. But I wouldn't try to dig the whole thing up and divide it like you would, uh, say, a peony, uh, because it's not going to like doing that. And Gretchen, you have a nice compost pile going. Terry wants to know, what kind of worms do you add to compost to help enrich the soil? I don't add any worms, um, but I also only have a what you might call like a seasonal compost. I've investigated doing the verma vermicomposting, which I think has a specific type of red worms that you mm -hmm. need to have. These are just earthworms doing their thing. Um, has, Huntington has really great soil. so. I haven't introduced any worms, but I have thought about in order to be able to compost year round, maybe getting some, some worms and doing that in the basement. Oh, I have cool. friends who, who enjoy doing it. So yeah, if, if you have organic it. materials and pile them up, mm -hmm. the worms will find them. Yeah, and it's much more reasonable for people <laughs> yeah. who don't have this much space to do it. You can do right. it anywhere in an apartment. Yes. Right. Like that. Yeah. yeah, and it works oh, really right. well. And yeah. you can make a vermicompost tea out of it too. So you, if you only get a little bit of compost, you just put them in a little... Um, like a cheesecloth bag, yeah, um, and just steep it, steep it. Mm -hmm. exactly, mm -hmm. and then you can use that water to water your house plants or other plants, and that way you get the benefit of the vermicomposting without having to have a whole big setup. Huge amount of worms. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another question from Paz. Paz writes, uh, "What's Gresham's favorite plant in her collection?" Oh, oh. we didn't ask you that. Um, my favorite outdoor plants are my peonies, so they're all mm. done now, mm -hmm. but uh, the previous owners planted some and I've planted more and I just love that season of just having all these different varieties. And then my favorite food plant, I think, um, is the arugula as well. It's yeah. just like such a good, good <laughs> you can eat it all year, uh, all season It just long. feels healthy eating it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's it's going to soon have to be sun chokes because you're going to have sun chokes True. forever. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have a lot of sun choke recipes. You're going to have to find yes. recipes for arugula and sun chokes. Yeah, I think those would go pretty well. They would. Yeah, because yeah, the sun chokes are kind of bland. Yeah. cool thing about peonies too is that this is the time of year to divide them. You know, mm. Most of the plants, most of the flowers we think of, you divide them in the spring or early mm. summer, but peonies are best divided in the fall. So if you do eventually get a peony that gets really big and you want to move it or you want to mm -hmm. dig it up and divide it, this would be a good time of year to do it. That's good to know. Yeah. Let's see. Any other, Any other questions, Mary? Yeah, Deirdre, our service berry tree is slow growing mm. and this year it's got orange spots. Oh yeah, I've got a service berry. You have a service berry? Yeah, it doesn't, well, it doesn't look. look very good, so does, yeah. <laughs> does yours have orange spots too? It might have some, uh, some stuff on it.
So thanks for coming. This has been All Things Gardening, the live stream edition here at Gretchen's house in Huntington. We did a tour. We answered a bunch of questions. Thanks for sending your questions in. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Gretchen, for having us. <laughs> thanks for coming to visit. It's a great place to grow. Yeah. And mm -hmm. thank you, Mary, for being the ambassador of the question. Absolutely. Yeah. Anytime. <laughs> thanks for having us. And hopefully we'll be doing more of these through the winter and into the spring. So if you like these, let Vermont Public know. We'd love to hear your feedback.